Hi, well, welcome to my third video for Forward Chess. I'm Yovi Hauske and this month I am going to be looking at my experiences along the Silk Road. Actually, I didn't go exploring. I went to Hang Shui to commentate on the IMSA World Masters Rapid and Blitz alongside Grandmaster Gata Kamsky. Now, the IMSA World Masters Rapid and Blitz is separated into two events. You have the Rapid event and the Blitz, which is 22 games. And again, there's a separation. There's a men's section and a women's section where you have uh, 16 of the world's best men and free women battling it out to, be to become Rapid and Blitz champion. And, you know, they paid for a tremendous amount of prize money. It really was quite impressive. And... Uh, it was absolute privilege to be there firsthand watching all the action. Now, the men's rapid event was won by Anton Korobov. Uh, he won with eight and a half points, 11, like one and a half points ahead of Le Quang Yem from Vietnam and Lenia Dominguez, who's having actually a huge comeback in the world of chess. I think he's now up to number eight in the rankings you know really very impressive stuff the women's event was won by alexandra kostenik with fantastic eight points out of 11 ahead of valentina gunina and maria mazicek um i will be taking my lessons from the rapid events because the blitz while well, it's a lot of fun the main lesson from to be taken from that event was just keep calm and don't blunder <laughs> But at the rapid event, I learned a quite a few in very instructive things. So the first things first, I have to say, I it was absolute one absolute wonderful experience to be commentating alongside Grandmaster Gata Kamsky. You know, at one stage it was Kasparov, Karpov, and Kamsky, and it showed. It, it, I really felt like I was being given a masterclass every day on how to think. And there were times where I thought, wow, this man sees everything. And he, you know, he predicted certain things and it came to pass. And it just felt like, okay, well, there's a, there's a higher chess understanding that. So that was my first lesson. The, you know, I know nothing. And uh, the other lesson, the other five lessons I'm going to be sharing with you now. Now, the first lesson that I learned was it's easier to attack than defend. So a case in point, let's take, is uh, this game that I, we witnessed between Lenia Dominguez and Dmitry Andrekin. So it came from a Scandinavian. I'm going to skip to move nine, where black has played queen e6. So this is a very unorthodox style. You know, it was a queen d6, c6 Scandinavian. Um, white has reacted very slowly with h3. And uh, black starts making some strange decisions like queen e6 check something very normal was instead of queen e6 check would it be just bishop g7 and i really don't think black has too many problems just you know concentrate on developing the king to safety it's all good and uh you know white played knight e5 and black played knight bd7 and then this is the case in point where it's easier to attack than defend so he could go queen e2 but if you follow that principle, you just simply castle. So the initiative means so much. So you just keeps on getting momentum. Knight takes e5, d takes, queen takes e5. And now here it comes, rook e1, queen f5, and uh, g4. Queen d6 is actually quite an interesting move, but uh, because after, as we go to rook d8, we have queen c7, and then the a7 pawn is on prees. But g4 was played. Queen d7, and then you can see the, the attack carries on with queen f3. So now white has, black has to do something with the knight on f6. Bishop g7, and again, it gets pressure and castles. And then you'd think here that perhaps the white's attack has fizzled out because the king has castled. But after rook a d1, the queen wants to go to c7 but it will be harassed again with bishop f4 so andrekin takes the decision to play queen e8 it's a little bit passive and then you can and you know and lenier does not let go bishop takes f6 bishop takes f6 knight e4 so a new momentum comes in now 
He should really probably go bishop g7, but it's difficult to calculate accurately here in these kind of uh, positions where one side is continuously putting pressure. Um, bishop h4 is also possible, but then bishop h4, you get a little bit worried about moves such as g5 and that bishop is left offside. Um, bishop e5 is another continuation. Um, and But again, you have to calculate what happens after knight c5 and then knight to d7. And if you're objective about it, you just simply go, yes, I can take on b2 and then knight d7 and then come back. And you say, well, I've actually got two pawns for the exchange. But again, this takes time and there's the, emo the element of emotion in chess. So here, you know, Andrekin just simply collapses after this pressure, queen c8. Knight takes f6. And I wanted to point out this pattern here. A queen on f6 is so, so dangerous. <laughs> you know, it really is. You know, we have ideas of h, h4, h5, h6. The rook is coming to e7. And then you can imagine the sibling will then jump to d7. And it's just a disaster. Um, if you're ever in this kind of situation, please just... Don't panic, don't lash out, just try to eliminate the attackers. So rook d8, just swallow your pride and try to grovel into a worse position. Because what happened in the game was it just unbelievable, you know, h5, opening another line of attack for white. Rook e7, and the game really doesn't last too long after that. So rook d7 and g takes 3, what a surprise. It's easier to attack than defend. Now, tournament winner Anton Korobov, remember he won the tournament with eight and a half points out of 11. Um, he, for me, played an absolute corker of a game as white against Dmitry Andreking. Now, it was a bit funny because during our interview with him, he, Anton Korobov was very modest and he kind of played down his achievements in the opening, just simply saying, well, I found myself in a worse position and I felt forced to sacrifice and and the following they reached the following position and uh, Anton played very aggressively with e4 after d5 it's kind of very mainstream just to go e5 um, not to play e takes d5 and he played it but you know Anton Gorovov just played e takes d5 and after knight e5 he found himself after queen c8 he found himself having to take a decision either you take on d5 and play with an, an isolated queen's pawn or you go hard, you know, and since it's a rapid play game and it's much easier to attack than defend, Anton just went for it with knight c3 and after d takes c4, d5. And, uh, you know, he, he, he was so mild-mannered in the interview that he was like, and then he hit everyone with d5. It is actually very, very thematic pawn sacrifice in the Queen's Indian. The whole idea is that if black were to initiate a mass of exchanges then it is white who's ready with peace activity you know the rook would be on f8 another rook would be an a8 white will have a dangerous dangerous initiative and uh, after rook d8 he, he played absolutely fantastic with the bishop on g5 putting more and more pressure it's easier to attack than defense and now you have ideas of knight takes f7 in the air so e takes d5 and in fact Gorobov played knight g4 but in fact it is actually possible to go bishop takes f6 bishop takes f6 and then play knight takes f7 which is just fantastic because you wouldn't really think that there's that much for white but there is king takes f7 queen the whole idea is that after king g8 it knight to d5 and then there, and after something like knight d7, this is the this is the critical point that knight e7. Now you have the threat of queen f7, followed by queen takes g7. So this forces king h8, and bishop takes b7, queen takes queen f7, and black has problems. But a uh, knight g4 was played. Queen takes g4 had to be answered. Um, just grovel just that's my recommendation when you're in 
these kind of situations, just try to eliminate the attackers. And so queen takes g4 had to be played and just allowing this rook to get to e7. But instead, knight c6 is just a horrible weakening of the king. Bishop takes f6, knight takes d5, queen f5. And I found it quite instructive here in this particular situation that uh, Korobov was interested in using all his pieces. So he went rook c1, you know, developing the last attacker, so to speak. After b5, b3, you know, I was very surprised watching this. I, I didn't think that b3 was the kind of move that he would play, but b3, completely logical. Also, you now have ideas of rook takes c6 at the right time. So king g7 takes bishop e4. The pressure is kept, you know, he's just completely relentless. So you, queen e6, you have to watch out for ideas of queen h5, queen g4. And uh, here knight f4, very instructive. So queen h5 is coming. So this kind of prompted Andrei Kin to take matters into his own hand and just play queen takes e4, queen g4. Queen g6, sacrifice the queen. But it's not the you know, it's not going to be that dangerous of a sacrifice because knight e5 is possible, it's, it's very, very strong. And the whole point is that white is forced to go rook takes e5 because this knight on e5 combined with this bishop on b7 is just unbelievable. They will cause a lot of terror. So f takes e5 and h4, very good. It's rook d3, queen e2. Rook a d8 and rook c1. So now, now uh, white is actually threatening to take on e5. In the previous move, white couldn't actually go queen takes e5 because after king h7, king h2, then rook d1 is just simply really, really unpleasant. And after g4, you can go rook a d3. And you can see that the bishop and the rooks are coordinating incredibly nicely on the light squares. So rook c1, now the threat is queen takes e5, check. And uh, black has to take a decision to move the king. So where to move? You have a choice of king h7 or king g8. And Andrekin chose king g8. Now, this brings me on to the second lesson. There is always danger lurking about, especially in rapid chess. And king g8 just looks very, very innocuous. But there is a problem, and the problem with king g8 is that the king is exposed to checks here. So you can imagine a queen coming to g8, b8, check, can be a problem. And uh, king, ironically, king on h7 is actually much safer. It's also on the same color as the bishop, so which means the bishop can help it out. So let's just do a comparison. So after king g8, king h2, very good. Uh, Korobov anticipates that this rook can come to d1 and go rook h1 with tempo, so he slides that king into safety. Uh, rook d2, queen e3, and now black would really love to play rook 8 to d3. Uh, no, not queen takes d3. And uh, But unfortunately, after queen takes a7, after bishop d5, we have queen b8 check. And the queen gets to check. And uh, now you have this idea of rook coming to c8 and you get an extra tempo to attack. Now, if you compare this with the king going to h7, after king h2, rook d2, queen e3, rook 8 to d3, queen takes a7, bishop d5. Now, there is no queen b8 followed by rook c8 in the air. There's no time. And instead, there's not even time to save the pawn because after you've got uh, rook f3. And this probably is a draw. The rooks, the rooks and the bishops are working so nicely together that it white black has compensation. In the in the game after rook takes a2, that's it. There's going to be curtains after rook c7 because there is no more compensation. Bishop has to go to a8, and it's easier to attack than defend push those pawns forward, open lines of at, lines to attack, and that was it. You know, Anton won in a few more, few more moves. Now, someone else who should have been careful about danger was uh, the, in the game uh, Zanzaya Abdul Malik against Lei Ting Jae. Now, Lei Ting Jae 
playing black, did very well in the Blitz. She actually won the Blitz and on tiebreak ahead of Alexandra Kostanyuk. And here she is playing against uh, Abdulmalik Zanzea, who was actually the, he's actually the youngest participant of the tournament. Now here there's a lot of danger for black, just on the basis of this bishop on h6. The problem for black is, of course, with this bishop on h6, the dark squares are weak, which in turn means the back rank is a problem, which in turn means that there is a lot of problem with the king. So to offset this, I would be looking at ways to defuse this bishop on h6, so perhaps looking at an eventual bishop g7, or being very careful with allowing white the opportunity to bring in any of the heavy pieces into the attack, especially when the queen is on Oh, sorry, pardon me. Queen is on f1. f1 not being able to coordinate with the rook. So, not sensing the danger, black plays rook a8. But this, of course, allows white to jump in immediately with rook queen a7. And then once rook comes to d8, rook comes to b8. And see the black king is completely helpless. Bishop f6, rook takes f d8, rook bishop takes d8, queen goes back to d4, and now there's problems with the, with this checkmate on g7. This then forces f6, queen e3, bishop e7, there's the last hope for black. So, you know, please take that bishop, please take that bishop and then allow me to get a perpetual, because after queen takes e7, queen takes f2. White can't escape the checks, but of course, Abdul Zanzaya simply plays queen e6, king h8, and says, yes, I won't take your bishop immediately, but I'm going to take it now after queen c8 check. And just like that, late team j's position falls apart. Always danger. You need to think about what your opponent wants to do. Now, this brings me on to the third lesson, which is respect the bishop pair. And uh, this game is between Gawain Jones playing white against Boris Gelfand in round one of the Rapid. And uh, that round, we didn't have, uh, neither Gato or myself had any access to the players' videos. So we couldn't see the, right, the actual physical reactions of the players. And uh, we were forced just to look at the, the games and just make commentaries based on the moves. Um, so we had a quick look at this. We thought black was absolutely fine. And then we came back to the following position. And uh, Boris has just played b6. And I thought, well, was the, the kind of the snap assessment was that uh, black has uh, simply just blundered a pawn. And Gata, looking at this position, thought about it for, I think I would say 20 seconds. And then he said, no, this is this is a very clever sacrifice. And I was thinking, no, cl clearly, clearly not. <laughs> it's blundered a pawn. And he said, no, no, no. Because what's going to happen is that after king, after rook takes d5, king comes to c6. And what is going to happen is this pawn, extra pawn on e5, is actually very, very difficult to mobilize. You need to mobilize it with g4, f5. Not so easy to do. To go, because after h3 you can go h5 and second second point is that black has complete control over the light squares and this is also followed by the fact that it's very easy for black to advance the queen side pawns and i was thinking yes yes yeah well now you put it like that i can see i can see how this is very dangerous what a clever sacrifice by Boris Gelfan. In fact, later on, I asked uh, Gawain Jones, was this, a, was this a sacrifice? And he said, no, no, no. Gelfan was shocked. Boris, Gel Boris was shocked when he realized that he was losing a pawn. Now, if we were going to retreat just one move back, after knight b3, the natural move is to go king c6. And it dawned on, on, on Boris that after knight a5, King, king c7, of course, you have rook takes d5, but after king b6, which is kind of planned, there's not a draw with knight b3, but instead b4 is in incredibly unpleasant. So let's fast forward on and let's have a look at what unfolded. So after rook takes d5, king c6, rook ft7. I'm just going to play through the moves so, so you can kind of 
understand and remember what Gata Kamsky said. You know, he said, talked about how it was difficult for whites to utilize this extra pawn on e5. It's easier for black to advance the queenside pawns and black had light square domination or uh, light square domination. So let's play on. So you can see this point being, it's very difficult to advance the kingside pawn is very true. Black is very mobile with center. And then watch what happens. G4, white doesn't really get a chance to advance the, the kingside pawn. And then here it comes, A5, A4, A3 is probably a mistake because it just saddles the pawns on A3, on A3 B2. Now it's really, white's really vulnerable to B5, B4. So here it comes. And you can see this extra pawn on F5 useless and uh, it is black the one that's pushing hard you know Gawain really tries to swap this bishop off and doesn't happen doesn't help and that's it and it's as Gata predicted it's the queen side pawn that will win the game the light square bishop was just overwhelming and of course uh, go, uh, go Boris Gale found one very elementary. Now this example really, really impressed me because I understood that this was a higher level of chess. This was somehow, he was looking, Gatta was looking beyond the horizon and looking at the potential of the position, which is something actually I touched upon in my, my earlier video. So my next two lessons that I took away from the IMSA World Masters Rapid were know your endings and keep calm. By endings, I specifically mean rook and pawn endings. There were a huge amount of rook and pawn endings on display. And by being calm, well, no one can play good chess when they are hot headed. Now, for those of you who watched uh, my second video on the European individual women's, you will know that these two rules are very close to my heart since I fell foul of both of them in the last round. And uh, this cost me a place at the Women's World Cup. Such is life. So when I saw the following position, from uh, Yu Yang Yi against Ralph Mamadov, I was very intrigued. And so the, my first point, of course, I asked Gatikamsky, you know, he was my co-commentator, super strong player. And he said, it's a very complicated ending, but it has been covered by Dvoretsky. So I decided before I would book, I would decided to do some research into perhaps some, some of the rules. And he suggested uh, Dvoretsky. Now I have a physical copy of Dvoretsky's Endgame manual, but that is up there in my loft and it's not easy to get a hold of because I'm in the middle of a DIY renovation project and no, I'm not sort of sorting through cardboard boxes to get to that book. So instead, I decided to check out what books were available on Forward Chess. So I'm going to show you how I found the adequate resources. So here I am using Forward Chess on my computer. So what I'm going to do, because I know I don't have any relevant books in my library, is I'm going to check out the store and see what they have available in Rook and Pawn Endings. So I've typed in the word Rook and the following books have come up. Now three books that really spring to mind because I know that they're by a renowned author as well is, is Mastering Essential Rook Endings. Uh, typical rook end games and basic rook endings, and they're all by Id Adrian Michal Shishin. So, and but at the minute, I don't know which of those books is relevant. Remember, I'm looking for a very specific rook and pawn scenario where I have an extra pass pawn on the flank. And so, let's check out essential rook endings. This is the top of the list, and let's have a look at the contents. After I've minimized the board, I can see lo and behold, we have. Rook against pawns, and there it is, chapter two, classic rook endings and extra pass flank pawn, part one, part two, part three. So that is the book I need, that is the book I'm gonna get, and let's have a look at how it looks like in my library. So one of the things you have to keep in mind is that if you use forward chess on a laptop, you cannot download the book. You cannot read it offline. Because of copyright issues, 
you need to have an internet connection but you'll have all your books available for you on on because they're everything is stored on the cloud and here i have i can get mastering it and uh here we can see a scenario a very famous scenario with botvinnik against boleslavsky and the rule here is that a rook whether it be an attacking or defensive rook it should be behind a pass pawn now there are other few rooks the other rules as well and let's see how they transfer over to the in-game Yu Yang Yi against Ralph Mamadov. Moving back to the game. And one of the things I learned by reading that chapter on essential Rook and Pawn endings was that Rooks, be they attackers or defenders, love to be behind past pawns. Secondly, I learned that the attacker has two plans available to them. So the first plan would be marching the, the past pawn all the way up the board. Now this plan is especially effective when the kingside pawns of the defender are very weak or isolated or you have a second past pawn. The second plan available to the attacker is to march the king all the way to, in this situation, the queen side to assist the past pawn. And Looking at the position now, we can see that black has a threat of going b3, b2, and then giving a side check and promoting the pawn. So this is why white's responded with king f1, king f4, b3, king f3, and then we have a critical moment and black starts taking action. So it decides to play the second plan, which is to mobilize the king. And this is why we see the move g5. And white has a choice here. White can go rook b7 check, or white can simply capture the pawn. And the safest, in my opinion, is to go pawn takes pawn, king takes g6, and then use the position of the fact of the, of the pawn and play king, rook b6, king g5, and now stop the king from advancing and playing king g3. And here, b2, rook b5, king g6, and now you have forced to go king g2 and tie the b1 rook down. This is, I think, is a straightforward draw, but white chose something which is highly, highly, highly risky and played instead of the g5, it played rook b7. Now, I'm going to give a spoiler alert. Something unexpected happens, and it's a little bit because of this situation, of this decision, but it's not to be recommended. And uh, rook b7, king g8, and king f2. Now, this move is not advisable because the king, white really should be getting the king in its ideal defensive square of going king g2. King f2 allows the king to start making a journey. Moving down, we see king g2, king e8, king f2, king d8, and the king starts making. Now, if you know your pawn endings, let's go, let's go to fast forward a little bit. You can see, makes it seven, okay. You can, if you know your pawn endings, you can actually predict what will happen next. Now we can see that the pawns on g4 and h5 are particularly weak. All that is needed is the king and pawn ending would be one because we would play king e4, king f4. If we look beyond the fact that we have a rook and pawn ending and we look to the future, you can see that certain things are in favor. So this is why the very elementary way to win and why this whole approach of playing g4, of playing rook b7 check was highly, highly dubious is because black can simply play b2 and after rook d7, move the king somewhere. And after, after checks, king goes to f4 and that's it. The pawns are weak. If uh, white were to wait and play rook b6, then rook e1, Rook takes b2 check, king rook e2, and that is a winning king and pawn ending. Black has the opposition, and the g4 pawn and the h5 pawn fails. Remember what I said at the beginning, that this plan of pushing b2 
works when the king side pawns are really weak. And here they are super weak on g4 and g5. However, do you remember rule number five right at the beginning, which was keep calm? Well, this was very, very important rule. Never, ever, ever forget it. Because after king c2, black did not stay calm. And instead, started playing very hot-headed moves. So king b2, rook c6, rook d1. Rook c1 would have been okay. Rook takes h6. It's going wrong. King c3, rook c6. King b4, rook b6. And instead of being calm and just accepting you've made a mistake, go back, accept the inevitable, it's going to be a draw. Black really starts pushing hard and aggressively thinking, well, I must be winning because after all, I was winning before. Mm -mm -mm. Remember rule number five, it's the most important rule <laughs> of rapid chess. Well, actually, anytime you're in time trouble, keep calm. And instead what happens is after h6, Rick d7, king f3, king c3, king c2. I'm going to play just through the moves so you can kind of enjoy that even the best players in the world do strange things. B2, just make me... F I also, I quite like this example because then I feel good, a little bit better about my own mistake in the last round of the European individuals. Rook b7, king takes g5, and that's it. White is winning. All that's needed now is to sacrifice the rook for the pawn, and here it is. And those two pawns will queen. So, in summary, these were the th five lessons that I learned from the IMSA World Masters Rapid. First, it's easier to attack than defend. Number two, protect your king. In other words, danger is lurking in every corner. Take care, don't put them in vulnerable squares. Number three, respect the bishop pair. The bishop has such a dynamic force. I mean, you just have to take at the late, look at the latest game between Dinglerin and Magnus Carlsen at the Croatia Grand Chess Store to see how fabulous they are. They just overrun the position with the dynamism and the fact that they can restrain the knights. Give your knight an anchor. Do your best to neutralize them. Number four, know your endings. And this walks hand in hand with the fifth one. Just keep calm. If you know your endings, you'll have the ability to keep calm, think ahead, and look to the future with promise. Those are my five lessons from China. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Until the next.